Hamilton also advises his clients to delay litigation whenever possible. And here, Hamilton is sort of playing the long game, and he's thinking that really the solution to these anti-loyalist statutes is for time to pass, for people to forget about the war as much as they can, and for them to change the law. And so until that happens, it's best, if you can, to avoid going to court at all. But sometimes that can happen. So Hamilton advises his clients to settle out of court whenever possible. Because then as now, you'll probably get a better deal if you're an unpopular plaintiff, um, or unpopular defendant rather, if you can kind of make your own deal rather than put it in front of a jury that hates you. Okay, Hamilton's next part of his pro the multi-pronged strategy is private petitions to the state legislature. This strategy is not meant to change the law, but it's meant to get some exceptions to the law. And it doesn't work for every client, but for example, uh, Hamilton has a client who is a widow with children, and during the war, her husband was attainted under the Confiscation Act, which means the family's property was taken by the state. But now the widow is destitute, and you know she's pretty sympathetic, and so Hamilton has a right up a petition, he presents this to the legislature and says, you know, she's not really an enemy of the state and she's just a poor woman with her children. Can you cut her some slack? And the assembly does. So it works. But it wouldn't work with every client. Nevertheless, it does get justice for that one particular client. As any good lawyer would do, Hamilton exploits technicalities whenever can get his client off the hook. And when worse comes to worse, Hamilton engages in a public letter writing campaign. And here he writes these two brilliant articles under the pseudonym Phocian. And it's to the people of New York. And basically what he argues is, New Yorkers, I know you hate the loyalists, but you don't want to start this precedent. You don't want to start the precedent that any persecuted minority can lose their legal rights. Maybe now it feels good, but you never know. Maybe a day from now, maybe a year from now, maybe a decade from now, you will be part of that minority and you don't want your rights taken away. So don't start it now. Hamilton is right about one thing, that it wouldn't be too long before the law changes and indeed, before Hamilton goes off to be the first Secretary of the Treasury, the law of New York State has changed. The anti-loyalist statutes are revoked or modified, and New York State adopts a Bill of Rights that specifically gives all New Yorkers the right to the due process of law. Now, I start with this episode because I think, at least in my experience, framers uh, and statesmen like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, they usually get most of the credit for being the, the founders interested in preserving rights. And Hamilton, he often gets the reputation of being an elitist, period. But I think these first early years and then the rest of his private practice demonstrates that Alexander Hamilton was very interested in preserving the rights and liberties of Americans. And uh, his first foray into practicing law, that's exactly what he demonstrated. So I'd like to move on out of private practice and into Hamilton's tenure as the first secretary of the treasury. Now he stops practicing law and taking on clients uh, in that sense, but he doesn't stop practicing law uh, in the sense that he applies his training and a legal mindset to everything he does in government. And here, Alexander Hamilton influences the development of American law by influencing the development of something brand new, that's executive power under our new constitution. Now famously, Alexander Hamilton is interested in creating a very strong executive. <coughs> And an, and an executive that's unitary. Just one guy making a decision, not uh, a committee. 
And he always says that he wants his executive to have energy. So what does that mean? Well, partly for Hamilton, having energy in the executive means giving that executive discretionary authority to act and to act now and to not have to have someone revise your decision. And he accomplishes this in a little known statute today that was actually a really big deal back in the early decades of our young republic. And that statute is called the Remitting Act. I doubt anyone has heard of it. But I'm gonna tell you about it. First though, a story of how Hamilton came to even thinking about this statute and the Remitting Act, uh, what it becomes. The story starts in January of 1790 with a British merchant named Christopher Sadler. And Sadler comes into the port of Boston trying to import goods so they could be sold and inadvertently he violates Congress's brand new revenue laws. Now the federal government is not a year old yet, these laws are even newer, but what they do is the regulations on how goods and ships are to be received at port. And Sadler has violated these laws. He didn't know anything about them. And the penalty for violating the revenue laws could be quite extreme, including a fine, which isn't that extreme, but also including a confiscation of your cargo or even your ship. And that's what happens to Christopher Sadler. So he's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I was breaking these laws, you know, I'm not trying to defraud anyone. So he petitions Congress asking for relief. And Congress has this habit of just punting petitions off to a cabinet secretary. And Sadler's petition lands on Hamilton's desk. And when Hamilton reads Sadler's petition, he is mortified. And he's mortified because this looks bad. Hamilton, as you know, is very interested in paying down our debt at the time. And in order to get tax revenue to pay down the debt, we need to do a lot of business with the Atlantic world. But Sadler's situation is demonstrating that it's tough to do business with us. You'll get hit with these really heavy fines. And so Hamilton is immediately thinking, uh oh, this can't stand, it can't, this cannot keep happening. So he responds to Congress. And with regard to Sadler, Hamilton basically says, give him a stuff back and give him a warning. You know, he didn't mean to violate the law. It's just a good faith mistake. But Hamilton also says to Congress, oh, I think this will happen quite frequently. And so you should vest somewhere a discretionary authority to make these sorts of judgment calls, to determine whether or not fraud is involved and to remit or mitigate any kind of penalties associated with these new revenue laws. Oh, and by the way, I think it should be vested in me. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, in May of 1790, that is exactly what Congress does. And they pass an act, here's the full title of the act. It's called an act to provide for mitigating or remitting the forfeitures and penalties accruing under the revenue laws in certain cases therein mentioned. It's what I refer to as the Remitting Act. And what Congress does under this statute is it basically codifies Hamilton's suggestion and it creates a two-phase process. So phase one of the process is recruiting federal district court judges to act as administrators and collect the facts surrounding all sorts of revenue petitions. So if someone wants a remission from the, from the Treasury Secretary, then um, the district court judge is going to have to gather evidence, gather the facts, take any kind of affidavit, collect it together, and transmit it up to the Treasury Secretary, who is phase two of the process, and he is vested with the complete and sole authority to decide whether or not a penalty associated with the revenue laws should be mitigated or completely forgiven. Totally the Treasury Secretary. So I imagine that some of you might be thinking, you know, well, gee, Kate, 
um, it sounds like there might be some friction if that's the process. Because basically what I just described is that judges are acting like administrators and the executive guy is acting like the judge and don't the judges feel like, hey, you're stepping on my toes, I'm the judge here. But the reality actually was, no. Both the judges and Hamilton, they played along really nicely. They developed a collaborative relationship. And when you read the correspondence between the two, and a, and a lot of correspondence had to go back and forth between the judges at Port and Hamilton, you see that the judges were happy to be part of this relationship and they didn't give Hamilton trouble. Uh, they oftentimes would send along the facts along with some kind of commentary like this is how I would decide the question or this is what I think really happened and you know give Hamilton some advice and Hamilton would would accept it in a good-natured kind of way but would always say to the judges if he needed more information he'd ask for it and if he thought the judges did a poor job of collecting the evidence he'd tell them and say do it again I can't make my decision so Alexander Hamilton influenced, therefore, this development of discretionary power in the executive in the Remitting Act. But the Remitting Act itself lived on way longer than just Hamilton's tenure in the Treasury. The Remitting Act, in some form, existed in law at least through the 1830s. So that means that a number of Treasury secretaries had this role, a number of federal judges participated in the process. And so inevitably, at some point, it would happen that you'd have a petitioner who asks the Treasury Secretary to excuse his punishment, his penalty, and the Treasury Secretary says no, and then the petitioner doesn't like it and sues. And that happened a number of times. But every single time it happened, either the district court judges or the circuit court judges who are presiding over that particular case would always say, we, the judges, have no authority to make this call. The discretionary authority is only in the Treasury Secretary. Congress has said as much, and we have no power to give any kind of oversight. It's his call and his call only, which I think is pretty remarkable. And a great example of how Hamilton influenced law a really important law in the early years of the Republic uh, for well after his time in office. 